We're going to get started shortly. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event with the Digital Minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tain. My name is William Wu, and I'm the president of Taiwanese Harvard Taiwanese Cultural Society. Our organization has a dual mandate. The first is to provide a fun and inclusive space for students interested in our cultural heritage. The second is to spotlight Taiwan to the international community through impact-driven events like our keynote speaker series tonight. It is my pleasure to invite incredible global leaders like Audrey to be with us. To our viewers online, we are all very grateful that you are here with us, and tonight's session will be moderated by yours truly. The format will be interactive. We'll be first sampling questions from the Slido platform that's provided in the Google Meet chat, and we'll select a few people in the end for our live Q&A session. While Audrey needs no introduction, I think it will be nice to provide a quick overview of her incredible journey. As Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey is in charge of the Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee, the 12 Years Education Curriculum Committee, and a community platform such as GovZero and v Taiwan. So without further ado, let us begin. So Audrey, I think it would be nice if we kick off this moderated discussion with about um, your background and how you form your personal identity. I know a lot of people often give you a lot of titles, you know, the digital, digital minister of Taiwan, the first non-binary executive Yuan member in our country, the profoundly gifted genius who worked as a consultant with Apple in the past. You know, with these titles and recognitions, I'm sure you might be overwhelmed sometimes. So if you're given a chance, how would you describe yourself? Who and what inspires you to become the you today? So um, good luck of time, everyone. Um, I hope the, the sound and uh, video is getting through and feel free to scan the character or click the slider link. Uh, now, um, it's not entirely democratic because you upvoted uh, the question with one vote, uh, bypassing the question with two votes, uh, but we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, let people vote more uh, on Slido while we are tackling the first question. Now, um, I would describe myself, uh, I guess, as Taiwan's digital minister, currently in charge of social innovation, open government, and youth engagement. Uh, my main aspirations uh, is the internet itself. Uh, in particular, when I dropped out of the junior high school when I was 14 years old, I told my teachers that, uh, you know, this, this new thing called the Wild Web and my textbooks were out of date. I want to do research 16 hours a day uh, instead of just eight hours a day after school and so on. Uh, and my teachers all agree with it. Actually, my principal helped me convincing my parents. Uh, and ever after that, I'm uh, self-educated on the internet without the generosity of the open innovation community, of the internet society, of the free and open source communities. I would not be able to learn uh, with this community of, and frankly, speaking, very altruistic people. So I see myself as a kind of tentacle, I guess, from this tribe uh, of digital democracy and into the Taiwanese government at the moment. But I'm also on the board of like seven other uh, international uh, social innovation organizations to get through this idea of the technology should adapt to the people instead of asking people adapting to the technology. So if just use one word, I guess I would call myself a, a pluralist. I see. Well, it's really, really exciting to have you here tonight with us. And I guess we'll kick off with the first question. How do your identity and background influence the way you navigate the world? And what was the process of self-realization like for you when you are searching for both identity and strength? Yeah, uh, so I, I see my identity as something of a kind of meta identity. That is to say, uh, I don't describe myself as I am. Uh, something or something. You you may have noticed that I uh, emphasized that I had this experience and I'm in charge of this or uh, I work with these people, uh, but I, I don't say I am a something. And even finally, I chose a noun, a pluralist. Uh, still, that now uh, encompasses uh, many uh, possibilities. And this is intentional. So instead of saying, for example, uh, that I uh, was a boy and I became a woman and now I'm non-binary, uh, I, I don't say that. I, I said instead uh, that I'm born with a kind of low level of testosterone. Um, so, and then uh, I had a puberty experience uh, when I was like uh, 
14-ish, and I had another puberty experience when I was 24-ish, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I would say that uh, I see myself not as uh, a single label or not even a cluster of labels, uh, but rather a continuation of experiences. So um, I think this uh, defined my politics, which is taking all the sides. Whenever I hear a story from someone that I could not relate to, I could not empathize with, uh, it's always my fault. It's never their fault. And I would then commit to spend more time with them or at least understand things better from their perspective, immerse myself in their culture and so on in a kind of transcultural way so that I can see my existing cultural experiences from the light of this new experience from them. Uh, but instead of saying, uh, making a judgment sign uh, from my point of view uh, or from my position, I would uh, strive to take all the positions. I see. Well, I think it's really, really interesting how you describe yourself as a compilation of experiences and that you're open to other perspectives. And I think with that as a leeway, it might be great to, for you to speak on your experience as a transgender person holding office, as well as how that identity kind of influenced the way you navigate a computer community. Yeah, uh, so actually, uh, when I came out uh, of the classes, so to speak, uh, I wrote a blog post to the computer science community because I was very much in the <clears throat> programming language research community at the time. Uh, uh, the title of the blog post was uh, Runtime Typecasting. Now, this is very much an in-joke. Uh, this is basically saying uh, the, the value uh, of ourselves should be the value that we hold uh, instead of the labels uh, that we cast or we put on those values. That is to say, instead of roles or types or classes or things like that at runtime, that is to say after we're born, uh, biology at compile time should not determine our destiny. Uh, and we can actually uh, recast ourselves as long as the, the actual value uh, that we hold uh, stays true. Now, uh, the computer science community uh, took that, I guess, very easily, maybe because the metaphor was actually pretty understandable to the uh, programming language nerds. Uh, but uh, in the uh, computing community, there's uh, a lot of people who identify as non-binary or transgender uh, or LGBTIQA+, I mean, beginning with uh, Alan Turing. Uh, so I don't think I've faced any resistance or, or anything uh, that uh, may kind of cast me uh, in a worse light uh, when I kind of change my names and uh, labels and online nicknames and things like that. Uh, now, uh, in the public office, uh, that's something else. I think in Taiwan, the career public service for the past 13, 14 years already kind of indoctrinated themselves on the idea of gender mainstreaming, which is very important. It started uh, as a gender equality committee uh, with uh, more seats from the NGO side uh, as compared to ministers and the uh, uh, formation of gender equality committee, which can uh, mandate impact assessments on all the bills, drafts, as well as budgets, is that uh, if there's more uh, men in the cabinet, then there's uh, equally number proportionally more women in the gender equality committees, civil society side. So it's always a balance. Uh, so after uh, more than a decade, all the career civil service understand very deeply uh, the ideas of intersectionality, of gender mainstreaming, of safe space, and so on. And uh, although it's not very visible uh, from the outside, we actually have a um, what we call the uh, a, a important gender statistics uh, database uh, that we just connected to the open data portal uh, in the past uh, couple months that measures on all levels of decision making and representation and so on. And all the bills, uh, drafts and budgets need to prove that it improves the gender mainstream work instead of uh, going backwards. So I guess what I was quite blessed to serve uh, six years ago in such a very inclusive environment. Uh, and there's already guidelines for, for example, uh, my office in the social innovation lab, uh, in that uh, office, according to the Ministry of Interior's uh, building guidelines, if you step into it, it used to be a kind of air, quarter, air force headquarter, but if you take it the wall down, which we did, uh, it became a public park. When you step into it, it into my office, uh, you see the restrooms that are uh, for women, for men, uh, for gender inclusive uh, non-binaries, uh, and also from uh, accessible wheelchair friendly. Um, 
on the on the ground floor and with kind of equal representation and uh this i think uh, speaks to the spirit of pluralism meaning that uh it's the technology that should uh, cater to everyone's wish uh, to have a safe uh space not just to express themselves but also to interact uh with other people so i'm, I'm happy to report that i've never faced discrimination quite the other way around uh the uh, guidelines and the civil service people that i've met already understood those key concepts uh, that we healthier uh, in the LGBTIQA plus community. It was really, really great to hear. Actually, when I was having my gap year last year in Taiwan, I had a chance to visit a social innovation lab together with my father. Mm -hmm. And I did realize that the, all the bathroom with, uh, with, um, was gender, gender neutral, which I thought was very, very progressive. And it's really nice to hear about the liberalization of gender politics in Taiwan. I think moving on to the next question, it seems like a lot of people are not too familiar with Gov Zero, Lin Shi Zhengfu, and V Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell us about your role and the reasoning behind each of these platforms and what's the purpose behind them? Certainly. So, um, almost exactly 10 years ago, uh, Gov Zero uh, was formed uh, to fork the government. Now, for people in computer science, to fork means uh, to take something that's existing, not writing it off, uh, but taking it to a different direction. Uh, and with the advent of decentralized version control and distributed ledgers, uh, fork also has a, a, a progressive meaning, meaning that we fork to merge, or we call it a soft fork, right? It's backward compatible, meaning that we acknowledge and respect the histories and traditions, and we uh, make a new versions of the public service uh, with the hope that the career public service will see the light and admit that it's actually a better idea, and then merge it back into the government services. So that was the vision uh, 10 years ago. And to that end, uh, a bunch of my friends uh, registered this domain name g0v.tw. Now, all the public service websites in Taiwan ends in something that gov.tw. Uh, but the idea is that if you go to, for example, join the gov.tw, which is our national participation portal, uh, but you change your O to a zero, uh, you get into the shadow government, join the g0v.tw. And uh, the zero began with budget that g0v.tw, which is a visualization of the national budget. Uh, and uh, at the time, the budget was uh, in PDF, thousands of pages long, very difficult to read, and so on. Uh, and at the time, the cabinet even filmed, I think, its first YouTube uh, public service announcement video uh, saying that the budget is too difficult to read, and they picture a lot of uh, just citizens uh, looking at numbers and words fly past their head and looking very confused. Uh, and uh, um, the voiceover said, uh, so, um, right? So, so don't even think about the budget, just implement the budget. Now, now that sounds downright authoritarian. Uh, and so it was very quickly flagged as spam. Uh, anyway, so uh, the netizen didn't like uh, being treated as children. So uh, the fork budget G0VTW not only provided upvoting and downvoting of each individual budget item, visualized using treat maps, bubble maps, and so on, but also uh, in, includes uh, real-time feedback, uh, commentary, and things like that uh, for real-time discussions. And later on, Gov0 would also uh, convert the uh, really aged um, real-time live streaming of the parliamentary proceedings on debating the budget and so on uh, into something uh, like the modern-day uh, Dan Mu, right? You can real-time caption uh, using your comments and so on. So it's all to lower the threshold of participating in politics and making sure that people who have something to say to contribute can do so instead of just demonstrating to protest, right, to protest against something. It's demonstration for something, uh, with something. So with the people, not just for the people, and certainly not just against the government. So in 2014, when people occupied the parliament uh, for the Sunflower Movement uh, that March, uh, the main idea at the time was that people um, want to deliberate about the trade service uh, agreements saying they don't want to see the parliamentarian kind of just you know going on strike refusing to deliberate that so gap zero helped the facilitators the 20 ngos occupying the parliament to set up real-time live streaming captioning um translation and so on services so that if you're one of the half a million people on the street or many more online you can very easily tune your attention to one of the very specific discussions about the training service agreements and then contribute your two cents. And then the facilitators, uh, after three weeks of occupy, gradually converge on coherent, blended uh, volition of uh, pretty much everybody 
for example, about the uh, use of 4G infrastructure from so-called private sector from the PRC regime in Beijing. Now, I understand everybody else will be having the same conversation about 5G many years down the line, but that was one of the topics we discussed uh, with the Gulf Zero support uh, during the Occupy. Now, so the Occupy was a victory because those coherent demands was then ratified by the head of the parliament. And then we, the occupiers and facilitators, were invited as reverse mentors, people younger than 35, to advise the cabinet members in a kind of uh, mentoring. Uh, I don't know which direction, I guess it's bi-directional. So I was then uh, hired uh, by one of the ministers, Minister Jacqueline Tsai, uh, to work on V Taiwan, which is her idea of making sure that uh, the code, uh, which is law, uh, the code of law, can be updated on the same way, as the same iteration as the code of software. And when a new code of software enters the picture of Taiwan, for example, so-called sharing economy, at the time when Uber came to Taiwan or Airbnb or whatever, uh, then we have a systemic way uh, to kind of run a sandbox like conversation and gather people's ideas and feelings from online conversations. And the most upvoted one will then set an agenda, not unlike Slido, but uh, again, uh, spread through three weeks of time. We use another system called Polis for that. And so uh, it was really successful. It helped to push through uh, the kind of uh, polarization around sharing economy or gig economy or whatever. Uh, so uh, it moved from a kind of showdown between opposing sides uh, to today with the diversified taxi program helped co-created by V Taiwan. Uh, Uber is a legal taxi company, the Q Taxi, but the uh, taxi company's law uh, were relaxed so that local churches and temples and existing co-ops and so on can also take advantage of the surge pricing and other dynamic dispatch, which is real innovations brought by Uber without undercutting existing meters or sacrificing uh, workers' rights and so on. So uh, a net win for everybody involved. And so uh, I worked as an intern-ish, a uh, reverse mentor for a couple years in the cabinet. And when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen took office, I got promoted uh, from intern to a full minister uh, in 2016. I hope that answered the question. Oh, that's a very, very elaborate answer. And um. Now, when I first got on GovZero website, one thing that jumped out to me was the visualization of government budget. Because I also feel like reading through Excel is really, really annoying. And the fact that you can see the government budgeting in one clear view is really helpful. And for those interested, I also think V Taiwan's work on financial sandbox and Uber regulation are very interesting. They have case studies online that you can take a look as well. Um, moving on to more of a spicy question. Um, here's a question. With regards to the long-term threat from China, what plans does the Taiwan government have for cybersecurity safety in the, in the future and for to dealing with the Chinese threat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on two levels. Uh, one is the, the hardening of our public and civic infrastructures against more traditional cybersecurity uh, attacks. And we work with white hats. For example, one of uh, my first actions when I became digital minister is introducing this system called SenseStorm. Now, Sandstorm uh, is a server security product that is almost exactly like the Google apps uh, for works workspace. Uh, but so we have uh, collaborative spreadsheets, documents, you name it. Uh, but the idea, unlike uh, Google's offering, is that we can host it on our own on-premise uh, servers, the internal cloud, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it uh, takes a kind of zero trust um, stance when it comes to the individual apps. So we can incorporate any of the popular apps. Uh, we started uh, with uh, Etherpad. Nowadays, we're using HackMD and so on. Uh, but whatever the free software community is using nowadays, we can repackage it very easily into Sandstorm. And one of our more popular apps were uh, ordering lunchbox together, written by a junior uh, civil service member. They don't have to take uh, a lot of cybersecurity or defense trainings because uh, the sandbox in which uh, that the, their application run already blocks all outgoing connections uh, to the wide internet and it adopts a capacity-based model so that uh, there's no um, site communication or channel communications without uh, explicit authorization. Uh, anyway, so the idea is that we then work with the white hat community, for example, DevCore, uh, which will go on to win, I think, second place in uh, Hikon, uh, 
uh, DEF CON CTF and so on. So like really bright uh, white hat hackers and they, uh, along with other teams, attacked the Sandstorm system uh, for half a year, uh, filed, I think, three CVEs. Uh, and then we, we fixed them and so on uh, because it's all open source and also benefiting other governments and other uh, communities before deploying it as a self-service uh, platform for all uh, people. So uh, like the video conference uh, platform, GC Meet and so on, uh, or Polis itself, which is also uh, under a GPL free software, uh, we all contributed into the commons and asked the penetration testers to uh, to work out uh, whatever vulnerabilities uh, to work with the community instead of uh, distancing ourselves from the white hat community. The idea is that if you're a white hat in Taiwan, uh, we will uh, work all the kind of payment structures, incentive structures, and so on. Uh, so you can be uh, rich and famous instead of uh, falling to the dark side, which always has more cookies, I guess. Uh, so that is the infrastructure level. Now on the uh, application level, we also uh, work with uh, the ecosystem of fact checkers, journalists, uh, antivirus companies, of course, uh, to tackle the disinformation crisis, or as some people say uh, during the past couple of years, the infodemic. Now the infodemic, we take an epidemiological approach. That is to say, uh, we're not specifically about single singling out any perpetrator uh, or things like that, because um, sometimes people just blindly share in a kind of sense of outrage without uh, thinking through about the veracity of such information. And that is actually a layer uh, where PRC, as well as other uh, outside in influencers, uh, really uh, Powered, uh, their energy, especially leading up to the election. Uh, I'm sure uh, you in the US know something about that too. So anyway, the idea is that uh, we uh, use this idea of uh, viral vaccination. Uh, people who have participated in fact checking or left about what we are calling humor over rumor, uh, funny memes uh, that dispels those rumors while being themselves more viral than those uh, rumors, uh, then helped to lower the R value, uh, the basic transmission rate of those uh, initial more toxic um, ideologies or memes or things like that. And we also work uh, with the civil society so anyone can flag uh, the incoming misinformation on COFAX or on Trend Micros, uh, or on who's cause, uh, there's uh, many in the ecosystem, but just like flagging your incoming email as spam, uh, review something about the fingerprint of the email uh, spammer, uh, people are voting such disinformation before it spreads uh, wildly, allow us to contact trace before it uh, gets into community spread to use uh, the analogy of epidemiology. And then we uh, make sure the contact tracing uh, is public information. We will uh, put on mandatory label when you share on more anti-social corner of social media. Uh, this message is sponsored by the um, Chinese Communist Party's Zhongyang Zhenfawei Chang Anxian, right? The political and law units. And in Hong Kong, uh, really there were uh, teenage protesters and the photo was from Reuters. That part was true, but they were not paid, and I quote, $200,000 uh, to murder police or recruit their uh, younger siblings to uh, get iPhones or something like that. Uh, that was entirely fabrication from the Weibo account of the Chang'anjie. And, and once people uh, see that mandatory label, when they share it, it's not like we're taking anything down. It's rather notice and public notice. So we uh, preserve the mRNA and change the spike protein, uh, so to speak, uh, so that people who spread those things become then more immune to the divisive conspiracy theories. How that answer the question? I see. Uh, it, it is amazing to hear about it is amazing to hear about the back and forth process that the sandstorm, sandstorm system has underwent and also about hearing about the fact checking process for, you know, the fake news coming from China and also the vaccine information. Uh, moving on, there is a question about the technical use case for blockchain and government. Yeah, Do sure. you mind shedding some light on that? Yeah. Um, I, I usually use the term DLTs or ledger technology because blockchain is just one of the many ways uh, to implement distributed ledgers. Now, with that in mind, um, so I think it's useful uh, when there's multiple data stewards that don't 
quite trust each other and need to establish a kind of consensus on what common good is. So we've seen, for example, uh, that the people who measure air quality, specifically PM 2.5, uh, around 2014-15, they don't quite trust the government uh, or the industrial areas to self-report uh, their pollution levels, uh, maybe for good reasons. Uh, one of the good reasons is that at a time there's less than 100 weather stations around Taiwan measuring uh, the PM 2.5 levels. Uh, and people said, you know, I know this polluter specifically because they know uh, that's exactly where those 87 uh, measurement stations are. They just purposefully built uh, around uh, those um, measure stations. So they took matters to their own hands uh, and working with uh, civic technologists, they built the LAS community and the Gov Zero Air Map uh, project of visualizing uh, the real time measurement of uh, at that time thousands and now nowadays tens of thousands of stations, many in the primary schools uh, or middle schools teaching data stewardship, uh, but also also in their own balconies and so on, because the people want to contribute the uh, young children uh, getting their hands on and uh, the idea of Arduino or Raspberry Pi or uh, more free software systems, uh, they want their first project to advise their parents uh, to make sure that when they uh, go to job in the morning, they don't damage their own health and or instead they will just go uh, you know, inside instead of going out or to job and so on. So uh, there's a very clear uh, social responsibility and impact angle in participation uh, in the Ledger. So when the National Center of High Speed Computation uh, want to join the foray to help doing the air modeling and the um, EPA, the Environmental Protection Administration, want to also uh, complete the puzzle by mandating the lamps in the industrial parks, also install the air boxes as designed by the citizens. They don't quite trust each other, but they want the same picture. Uh, so I, I believe they work with ledger technologies such as the EOTA, uh, Distributed Ledger, uh, and also the National Academy uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so that those data are uh, put on chain, so to speak, uh, so that people cannot uh, just lead into an election, go back and change the numbers. Uh, and even if the National Center for High Speed Computation is known for its uh, supercomputer prowess, uh, the design was such uh, that it cannot very easily uh, take over a public account of the air pollution. And then people feel much more um, at ease to contribute their models to be run by NCHT to uh, suss out the uh, mobile, immobile, and overseas the um, influences of the air pollution. And that model has been since then uh, taken to a local referenda about water pollution and waterways and so on, water box uh, and many other that has asked relief and so on. So it's no uh, coincidence that uh, in February 2020, just one month into uh, the epidemic, uh, we built this mask uh, rationing maps, more than 100 of those applications, uh, literally in just three days, because we piggyback on the existing mapping efforts from the Gulf Zero and many other communities uh, that already visualize the air and water uh, qualities. I see. Yeah, it is very interesting to hear about the usage case of universal ledger system on sustainability work and air quality, water quality control. Um, there is another question on how has Taiwan been able to maintain its technology edge? Um, actually, yep. Mm -hmm. What makes it what makes Taiwan so successful that it's such a critical country in global technology progress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the main uh, ideas that I like very much in Taiwan uh, is that social innovation and industrial innovation are not seen as kind of two polar sides of the spectrum. Uh, because I run an incubator myself in the social innovation lab. Uh, every year we admit uh, a dozen or so uh, startups and a dozen or so uh, impact-oriented organizations to incubate together. Uh, and I was just at a pitch day uh, a week ago. Uh, and this year, uh, in the two dozen pitches, if I close my eyes, I can't really tell which one is the uh, profit-oriented uh, startups and which one is the purpose oriented uh, impact organizations, they fuse together. Uh, so that uh, we, of course, there's very high profile cases, right? For example, TSMC working with Sujin and Foxconn to get a BNT vaccines, which is of course, extremely high impact uh, socially, but at all levels, I believe uh, Taiwan really cares about inclusive and sustainable 
innovation. We don't, uh, like in some other jurisdictions, uh, prioritize one sector over others. So uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, focus on banking or other uh, jurisdictions uh, focusing on the uh, manufacturing or things like that, uh, there tends to be some capture, right, of the industrial related regulations. So there's a, there's a kind of reasonable cost uh, uh, to the environment or to the uh, social um, cohesion. Uh, mm -hmm advance one particular sector over the others. But in Taiwan, um, it all has to be Pareto improvements. Uh, actually, it, it, it doesn't work if you just say we don't pollute or we don't disrupt the community. Nowadays, you have to say, how are you contributing to net zero? How are you contributing to the social cohesion and equity uh, instead of uh, you know just uh, standing by and doing nothing? And this has propagated not just on public listed corporations, but also small and medium enterprises. And that, I believe, allows the uh, SMEs, which are very agile to begin with, uh, to then work uh, with the community of people who can see those emerging issues. Certainly, the Airbox uh, civic tech people see those trends coming faster than the EPA uh, around PM 2.5. And that then inform Edimax and many other manufacturers to adjust uh, their products to serve uh, that particular level of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing uh, participants uh, in a kind of prosumer uh, fashion and that is i guess a constant uh, chance uh, to innovate again with the people not just for the people see it is great to hear how the private sector and the government sector in taiwan has been able to mobilize so quickly and be so agile in order to stay at the forefront of its technology um, another question that uh, people are interested in is if gov zero give people more power to influence public policy what happens if the decision of the people is not optimal you know for example um when people vote on removing the mask mandate, the mask saves life. I think this echoes with the idea of the risk for running with democratization mm -hmm. uh, in exchange for populism. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, many view citizen participation in the light of uh, previous representative democracy. That is to say the um, like once every four year or two year uh, voting and referenda and so on. Uh, and the common thing of these designs, uh, previous designs, uh, were that they're very low bandwidth. If you have a ballot of uh, 20 referendum questions, that's just 20 bits uploaded uh, once every two years, right? So the latency, uh, the time to wait between uh, actions uh, is very long. The bandwidth, uh, the actual bits that you're able to express is very low. So in a low bandwidth, high latency uh, situation, of course, uh, you would then say um, maybe uh, there's uh, some role for the face-to-face -face communications uh, of, or at least more low latency, high bandwidth conversations of a uh, small amount of people not exceeding Dunbar's number, right? A subcommittee of the parliament uh, or something uh, less than 150 people because they figure uh, optimal things out faster and uh, we have uh, ethnographic uh, evidence of that. But uh, that was um, before the internet. All of those uh, low bandwidth, high, la high latency uh, ideas of democracy were pre-internet. Um, nowadays, with internet, which is itself a inter-network, right, kind of connecting many networks together, the fact that we have the internet that we have to die uh, proves that it's okay to work uh, beyond the Dunbar's number in a more participatory way. And the key is that we move from the decisional stage, uh, from the decisional stage into the um, agenda setting stage. So one example is the slider. Right, so uh, if all of you are voting on Slido, uh, then maybe the top question is not an optimal question, but, but that doesn't matter because we're not making a finite resource zero-sum allocation at this stage. Uh, we're making an allocation of which question has discussed before other questions, but the length of time that we dwell on each question still depends on the nature of the question. Uh, so it is mostly just agenda setting power, not decision making power. And when we are doing agenda setting or in design thinking terms, when we're just discovering and defining our common values, the, the more the better. And we measure not by the head counts, we measure by the plurality, the diversity of people's opinions and feelings. So for example, in polis, when we uh, vote uh, on the UberX 
X agenda. It doesn't matter if you mobilize 2,000 people voting exactly the way you do, because the visualization shows the plurality uh, using K-means clustering uh, of the various different feelings of priorities. So uh, people's diversity matter, but it doesn't matter if uh, 2,000 people vote exactly the same. It just counts as one dot. Uh, so in that configuration, the incentive then become to convince people across the aisle, because we hold ourselves uh, to account only to answer the agenda that convinces across all the different Uber taxi um, drivers, uh, regular taxi drivers, passengers, and so on. Uh, and only these common values can uh, mandate a real-time stakeholder conversation, which again, is very low latency, very high bandwidth, using Slido-like technologies over live streaming, and so on. So we would not move to remove mask mandates, but we may brainstorm on how to communicate mask relationship with the coronavirus better. Actually, we did something like that, and uh, which converged into the message, the mask is there to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands, uh, which is a rough consensus, right? Even if you, uh, you know, have different takes on aerosol spread or things like that, there really is no denying that wearing a mask reminds you to wash your hands more <laughs> if you uh, get this message uh, to other people. It doesn't talk about respecting the elderly, respecting the vulnerable, it uh, appeals entirely on uh, rational self-interest. And that's kind of rough consensus we get from collective intelligence if we open up the ballot making power to the people instead of just the voting power on existing ballots. Yeah, I think um, I read somewhere on the GovZero page that actually democratization of policy making helps you to reach consensus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of a point that you touched upon just mm -hmm. now. Um, another question that people are interested in is what is something that you are currently working on that makes you jump out of bed every day with a sense of excitement and purpose? Yeah, today at 2 p.m., we're going to have a kickoff meeting of the 6G, sixth generation uh, telecommunication um, infrastructure uh, idea song. So, uh, the, and, and I'm very excited about that. The, the idea of idea song builds upon our idea of presidential hackathon which is for five years now, thousands of uh, civil servants, social innovators, entrepreneurs, and so on, work together to propose more than 200 each year uh, sustainable development goal targets, uh, realization plans in uh, answering to people's wishes. We call it a kind of wishing fountain, a xu yuan qi. Uh, so um, the idea is very simple. People use a new form of voting, a high bandwidth voting, called quadratic voting, uh, which uh, allocates exactly the same marginal cost to the marginal value of each vote uh, so that people can understand which synergies their ideas hold with other synergies of other people's idea when building uh, to accomplish the SDGs uh, together. So out of the 200 or so teams, uh, we QV quadratically vote uh, top 20. We coach them for three months on a local proof of concept and the uh, five ones that actually won uh, gets a trophy a shape of Taiwan with a micro projector underneath. So if you turn it on, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving you the trophy. So it's very meta. Uh, and the uh, promise of the uh, president is that whatever you did locally for the past three months will become public policy in the next fiscal year with all the personnel and budgets and regulation support. That's how we got, for example, a lot of telemedicine uh, and many other uh, like net zero uh, apps uh, for mobilizing people to uh, conduct their uh, actions in a more environmental responsible way and things like that through such social innovations uh, with the promised governmental support. Now, many of those uh, highly regarded ideas are uh, feasible in the next fiscal year. But sometimes there are some ideas that would only be possible uh, in the best estimates when we have true co-presence, for example, uh, with people in different uh, places that's like five years or 10 years down the line. Uh, so for those long horizon uh, ideas, previously we, we thank them, we give them a note of recognition and nothing happens. Uh, but uh, uh, this year we want to try something different. We want to then uh, use those long horizon ideas instead of coaching them into a POC which is impossible, right? We coach them to work with artists, the, the poet, 
interactive game designers, uh, the speculative designers, and so on, uh, to build in interactive futures, so to speak, uh, to realize their vision. And then we invite uh, the researchers working on 6G technology to actually live in the future for a while to guide their research uh, directions and so on, so that we have an impact not just on the next year's uh, fiscal budget, but we also have an impact on the national allocation of research uh, budget, again, moving from implementation level or decisional level for to, into the research and agenda setting level. I'm very excited about this more kind of long-term pluralist thinking. I see. Wow, the idea of on concept is extremely, extremely attractive. I wish I'm catching a plane right now, be back in Taiwan and participate in it. Um, another question that people are interested in is, with Taiwan being the first Asian country to legalize same-sex marriage in 2019, some may say that Taiwan is at the forefront of equality for all. However, the value system in Asia is still undeniably more conservative. So have you personally encountered resistance in your political, um, educational, and technology work? Yeah, uh, the internet was built upon this very pluralist uh, principle of post house law, and I quote, um, to be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept. So uh, so I think there's merits to both liberal and conservative thought, uh, because in, in Asia, uh, especially in Taiwan, it pays to conserve traditional institutions, especially when we have more than 20 uh, national languages, if you count sign language. Uh, and uh, the idea is that, for example, when we want to look uh, towards uh, matriarchal, uh, social configurations. We don't have to look far. The Amis culture is um, is matriarchal. Uh, the Taiwan culture, uh, which uh, I believe uh, is part of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, our president's upbringing, um, says that gender doesn't matter uh, when choosing lines of succession, uh, and so on. So there's many, many traditions in the indigenous nations, and of course, on the newer uh, migrants. Each of those cultures, in a transcultural way, bring something to Tsai about the plurality of possible social configurations, um, gender relationships, and many other relationships. And it, so it pays to conserve that. It, because if you drive progress uh, from one particular coach's point of view, uh, that is not progress. That is decimation, literally cutting by uh, one tenth, right? The opposing uh, side of the culture that uh, already exists in Taiwan and actually can engage uh, in conversations. So uh, I really uh, like the uh, ideas uh, that I believe um, David Greba uh, uh, and uh, the other David uh, expressed in the dawn of everything uh, is a new book that I was just reading uh, that talk about various uh, prehistorical uh, and uh, ancient uh, ways of configuring the society by the uh, more newer anthropological evidences uh, that all sort of social innovation is possible and probably have been tried and probably people are still trying it. Uh, so instead of driving progress on a single vision, we need to have a pluralist conversation so that become a conversation between many diverse values. So in a sense, uh, we don't face resistance. We are the resistance. We are resisting any particular optimizing view of uh, optimizing one particular utility, GDP or whatever, uh, to sacrifice the other equally important other uh, 16 different sustainable development goals uh, so that uh, we focus on a more meta level of conversation. So if you take conservative as a kind of conservationist of existing cultures and institutions, uh, I'm conservative too, but I'm liberal in what I accept. I see. Yeah, I feel like with the, with the way you talk about plurality, uh, it echoes a, a point that my professor used to make is you want to avoid making policy that's designing the fast train to the wrong station. Um, and I think that kind of echoes your thought. We have a very interesting question from our audience, Tom. Um, he said, I used to help with the National Security Agency work. And in our work, we found that there were big loopholes in the information security system of TSMC. Will the Taiwanese government consider centralizing the management of security system for high sensitive tech industry? Yeah, uh, I think we just proposed some drafts uh, on trade secret uh, protection uh, and so on uh, based on these uh, ideas. Uh, the draft, I think, uh, will be deliberated in the parliament, uh, so I will not uh, comment too much while it's being deliberated on in the parliament, uh, but that is something that is uh, very important uh, in our agenda. And add to that, uh, sometime this year, uh, we will also have a dedicated um, 
um, administration, uh, I think that's the true, right? Uh, a a uh, self-sustaining uh, government organ uh, dedicated uh, for cybersecurity. So the administration for cybersecurity I'm still thinking about the acronym, maybe ACE, right? So, uh, so the, the, the ACE people, the ACS people, uh, instead of just more of a coordinating role like the current Department of Cybersecurity, will also uh, take a more uh, proactive role uh, in defining the cybersecurity policies, especially uh, working with those highly sensitive and uh, highly important um, economic uh, sectors. Previously, the Department of Cybersecurity, because it's a uh, department within the cabinet office mostly focus on safeguarding our own infrastructures, the uh, public infrastructures, as I mentioned, but I think the economic uh, infrastructure and the civic infrastructure is equally important. So I think the uh, new administration of cybersecurity has a slightly larger mandate uh, as compared to the Department of Cybersecurity, partly motivated by Tom's question. It's, it's nice to know that Taiwanese government has the cybersecurity mandate to make things safer for us. Um, there's a question I think it speaks to more of your unusual education background since I know that you're um, self-learned a lot of things. Um, what are your thoughts on our current Taiwanese education system? What are we doing well on and what are some areas you think that we need to address more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think uh, the Taiwan education system, because I'm a little bit biased because I'm part of the <laughs> curriculum committee, right? Uh, we, we learned from the homeschooling and alternative education communities to put autonomy uh, and interaction toward the common good uh, as the core competencies. I think it's really good that we're one of the first uh, Asian countries to move beyond the literacy uh, mindset, the road to memorization, you know, this, this Asian uh, stereotype <laughs> thing uh, that uh, I'm very familiar with when I was a child. Uh, where we're moving on. Uh, so, for example, this year, uh, when we're uh, having the kind of every student use a tablet, uh, we make sure that the tablet uh, is constructed with competence in mind. Uh, the tablets, when you're constructing with literacy in mind, uh, mostly serve as digital alternative to books, right? Uh, but when you construct it with competence in mind, you have like sandstorm the room uh, to engage with the free software community for the kids, to build their own AI models, to improve their own class classrooms to build uh, forum like software like from the Minerva school and so on. So in a more federated way, uh, we want to open up the possibility for the parents and children to be co-creators uh, to the whatever curriculum implementation that they're, they're using. And I think they will uh, make the tablets a connecting device with their families instead of an alienating device like we have seen uh, in many uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, and so I think that's the good part of it. Uh, I think one of the areas that we need to address further is the use of assistive technologies. There's already a, a lot of very good technologies that can, for example, uh, provide real-time captioning when you're uh, speaking uh, in Mandarin. Uh, it's already eminently possible to machine translate that into English and uh, real-time caption that. It's um, very, um, Actually, uh, you were in ALS, you know what I'm talking about, right? So it's very mature technology now uh, and very affordable too, and you don't have to sacrifice privacy uh, for, for that to happen. But to the adoption of such uh, technologies in actual uh, tablet-oriented conversations in the schools is the uptake is low-ish. I think we need to build more trust uh, and more assistive frameworks. And that is important because um, if you look at the uh, education results of Taiwan's bilingual program, if you measure just the reading and comprehension listening parts, Taiwan's uh, children are already bilingual. Uh, what, what's missing is, of course, uh, the speaking and expressing, uh, the writing, the, the outbound parts. Uh, but that, of course, um, takes uh, forever right, to change. But if you have the right amount of assistive technology, because you already can spell check uh, the machines, right, because they don't have any problem reading the captions or listening to a uh, machine translated synthetic voice, uh, then uh, you become instantly bilingual if we just learn to use like eyeglasses, uh, assistive intelligence in our education system. So that's something I'm passionate on. I'm happy to help uh, both the alternative education community and the uh, basic education uh, community to to help that uh, make that happen. Wow, that really just blew my mind. And um, we have seven minutes left, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's time for us to transition to a live audience yeah. today. Yeah. So if anyone wants, please feel free to raise your hand, and we can uh, get started. Mm -hmm. 
Let's see. Oh, yeah, Yu Ting, do you want? Oh, I have to unmute you. Here we go. Um, hi, uh, I have a quite simple question about um. So you know, like Taiwan has different yuan's that, uh, I mean, like like executive executive and also like legislator and other uh, yuan's and then. I'm wondering how do you collaborate with other yuan, not just the legislative yuan or also the jurisdiction yuan, and also other like examination yuan and, and examination. Yeah, yeah. So I know that because most of the uh, resources are in the um, executive yuan, and then I know there's some like weakness in the cybersecurity of other yuan, and then I know there was a uh, news on that, like some uh, ha hacker maybe from China trying to. Take advantage of that, and is this issue being solved? Has, has this issue been solved by you or is other people? Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, yeah, and, and that's partly uh, of the motivation of the administration on cybersecurity, uh, because previously, uh, when it was just a department uh, within the cabinet office, it takes uh, cross yuan uh, negotiation, uh, because the uh, the idea is always that uh, the examination is examining us, the control yuan audits us, the legislative yuan oversees our budget, uh, right? And so the judicial yuan, of course, tells whether we're, we're legal or not. So it's them supervising us. It's very rare that the uh, the, the executive yuan gets to supervise uh, other yuans, but in in terms of cybersecurity, that's that's a must, right? So uh, I think the presidential office, the the actually the president is a constitutional organ specifically designed uh, to do uh, cross yuan uh, orchestration uh, with this idea of anti war cybersecurity, <laughs> national security. More and more coordinations are now being uh, moved uh, toward the national security council level. Uh, so we've uh, addressed that constitutional, I wouldn't say it's a loophole, it's a drawback right, uh, of uh, coordination starting from the executive yuan. And later on, uh, when we designed the uh, Kind of the founding acts of the administration of cybersecurity, uh, we were very clear uh, to make sure that they're in charge of the guojia, uh, zitongangjue, the international uh, or countrywide uh, cybersecurity related matters instead of just zhengfu, uh, which is within the executive branch and things like that. So uh, with the um, national um, Security Council's coordination and the new ACS, I believe we're uh, also making strides uh, to uh, resolve these issues in a more stable way. But nowadays, uh, with the coordination from the National Security Council, we already were able to establish cross and support. We still have time for a few questions, so please raise your hand. Um, see that Alice Chen has a question. Okay. Um, Allison, would you like to, to unmute uh, or you're in a place where you can type? Maybe. It's okay. not created. So yeah, what do you see the future of the LGBTQ mm -hmm. right, plus community, acceptance within Taiwan's culture, particularly for gender? And are there particular challenges that you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So um, as I mentioned, many indigenous nations uh, in, in Taiwan also have the, the uh, non-binary gender non-conforming the third gender and so in um, ideas right so so it or, or even um, the ideas of more than three right so uh, gender is an input field uh, so you, you can uh, describe yourself right so uh, I believe uh, as part of conservative uh, thought in Taiwan we need to um, make sure that we uh, communicate more uh, of those different kind of gender norms that already exist uh, in Taiwan. Already, uh, there's many um, films uh, in, in Taiwan tackling this uh, connection between the indigenous uh, cultures and uh, gender thoughts and gender mainstreaming and so on. So I'm uh, positive that people will understand more and more that there's uh, more than one way to structure uh, the gender norms and gender narratives in Taiwan, which I, I believe is fundamentally a good thing because uh, the idea is that 
said it's not about uh, I was part of this half of the population, I was then uh, part of the other half of the population. The idea is that I had an experience uh, working with uh, some uh, of these people of the same puberty experience, and then I had another experience working with these people. But it doesn't mean that I uh, learning English doesn't mean that I'm distancing away from Mandarin speaking community. It doesn't work that way, right? So uh, basically, uh, the, the plurality of uh, genders uh, is a fact. And when we make sure that we share our common experiences in a way that's truly transcultural, then uh, we can make it quite normal uh, for anyone in any biological configuration uh, to face not discrimination, but valued uh, for their different perspectives uh, to whatever issues that we're tackling about. And that is true inclusion. That's not just diversity or, um, you know, um, the, the rationing right, of seas and so on, uh, whatever that we do on this uh, diversity level is just to pave the way to true inclusion on a societal level. Um, I know a lot of people still have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. We are getting a hot, hard stop at eight, so I was wondering if people yeah, can come to the meeting. You know. Yeah, <laughs> you can open your camera, can turn on your camera, so we can take a group photo. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, like we can add more people. Um, okay, it's fine. Okay, I'll, I'll just take a screenshot. <laughs> well, we're getting kicked out right now, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining. A special thank you to Audrey for spending an early morning in Taiwan for us. And I just want to take this time to thank our executive team at TCS and all the people who has been part of the planning uh, committee. Um, this has been a great event, and I really enjoyed working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.